At this point, all that's left for me to do is to welcome our speaker, Professor Tony Arendt, from um, SFS and the Department of Government in Washington. He is Professor of Government and Foreign Service. He's also the founder and director of the Center for International Law and Politics at Georgetown. He's got, as most of you will know, a publication record as long as your arm. So we won't go into that. Um, and I'll uh, ask him up to the lectern at this point. Thank you. I want to thank Garrett very, very much. And I do want to begin with one serious moment. Uh, as I think everyone knows, Nelson Mandela passed away last night at the age of 95. In a speech given at the White House, President Obama, quoting a reference to Abraham Lincoln, said that Mandela now belongs to the ages. So could we have a moment of silence for a great soul, a great man, a true saint, Nelson Mandela. Thank you. Okay, uh, why don't we get started? Let me begin by saying uh, it was my honor to be introduced by Garrett. It was also my honor to serve on the search committee with Amal. Where's Amal? There he is, with Amal and a number of other people. And we did this search through the RPX room at Georgetown, which meant that some of us were in Georgetown and some of us were in Doha. And Garrett ultimately was in both places, both virtually and physically, uh, at various points in the search. So it was a real honor to be on that committee. And it's an honor for me to be here in Doha for my first time. Now. Many of you may have arrived on planes today or planes last night. I came in last night. I got about two hours of sleep. I may be completely incoherent. So if I say anything that doesn't make any sense, maybe I normally say things that don't make sense, but in this particular case, give me a little bit of a break. So Mary, you'll give me a, a little bit of a break on that. Okay. It's good to see a lot of friends out here uh, from the States. Rich Lucian and I were last together at the Gettysburg Battlefield when we did an alumni tour of Gettysburg in June. So it's a little bit of a different battlefield here today. But I am going to be talking about a very tragic situation, Syria, chemical weapons, and international law, something which has plagued the international community for the past couple of years and is perhaps in a little bit of a positive state these days, but we shall talk about it. The goal today is to talk about those six issues. Very briefly will I discuss the actual crisis in Syria. I suspect there are people in the audience who are much more experts on the details of the opposition parties, the details of the crisis. My focus is really going to go into international law. So I'll look at the nature of international law, just to familiarize everyone with that. Look at international law and chemical weapons. Look at the Syrian case. Look at a question as to whether U.S. intervention in Syria would be lawful under international law, and then briefly end with where we now are with respect to chemical weapons in Syria. Okay. Crisis in Syria really began as a popular uprising along the same time of the so-called Arab Spring. There were demands for the president to resign. Opposition forces developed and many people defected from the Syrian military. Something called the Free Syrian Army was formed. The government responded. It was soon aided by Hezbollah, Iran, others. Rebels found themselves aided by Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and potentially the United States in terms of aid to the rebels. It's a covert operation that's taking place. And another group entered in the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, which is an Al-Qaeda affiliate which also joined the opposition. So some opposition forces include the Free Syrian Army, Islamic Front, which consists of a number of Islamic organizations, Al-Nusra Front, which is one that has received funding from Qatar, and then again, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. It was a mess. The United Nations estimated that more than 100,000, should be another zero, people have been killed. Other estimates I've seen has gone as high as 126 thousand. UN High Commissioner for Human Rights recently, on December 2nd, indicated that the regime, including the head of state, was responsible for war crimes and crimes against 
humanity. Then there have been numerous allegations, and again, this is the primary topic of what we want to talk about today, allegations of the use of chemical weapons. Some go back as far as April of 2013, March. The one that is most spoken about is the alleged use of chemical weapons that took place on the 21st of August. And that is the one that the United Nations Inquiry Commission was going to be involved in. Now, like I said, a very brief overview. The challenge, a devastating civil war with more than 100,000 people killed, with allegations of the use of chemical weapons, also killing potentially hundreds of people and women and children. Now, one note, we're going to talk about chemical weapons. It's not a happy topic. It's a horrible topic. The one thing I have tried to do in the discussion and on the slides here is I do not have pictures of people who have been killed or are suffering from the use of chemical weapons. That was intentional on my part. But remember, when we're talking about these things, we are talking about horrible means whereby people have been killed, whereby people have been maimed. But again, I refrain from putting up any pictures. All right, so international law. How does international law figure into all this? First of all, what is international law? Ms. Costco, where is Jenny Costco? Can you give me a good definition of what international law is? Well, then we should be on par. <laughs> definition, I don't need to put your spot. Anybody give me a definition of international law? Just quickly, just a one, one, par one sentence. Yes? Okay, so, good. Set of rules that are binding on international actors. We're going to expand it, so yes. Set of rules which are binding on states, but they would also be binding on a variety of non-state actors. Individuals, international corporations, uh, ethnic groups, a whole host of non-state acts. So a set of rules which are binding on international actors. How is international law created? By states. States create international law. So states as the primary actors in the international system create international law. How do they do this? Anybody? How do states create international law? Okay, by treaties and no? Good. Customary practice. Give the man a star. All right. Two ways in which states create international law through treaties and through custom. Now, treaties we're all familiar with. Treaties are written agreements which states put together. There can be bilateral between two states or multilateral treaties among many states. So, for example, in my pocket, I have my passport, but that's not what I wanted to show you. I have the United Nations Charter. This is a treaty which has been signed and ratified by 193 states. So this is a binding international agreement among those states. We will be talking about a variety of treaties over the course of this presentation. But that's one way in which states create international law through treaties. The other way which the gentleman... Now, tell me your name, sir. Uh, <laughs> I don't actually think that's not fair. That's actually good. <laughs> So, Clayton, okay, tell us about customary international law. How does that come about? Uh, basically, the behavior of states over years is the norm Okay. Perfect. I give the guy, what did I, I won't answer the grade I gave you, but I'll give you an A now. We'll go back and change the grade, see if we can do that. <laughs> Perfect. Customary international law is created through the practice of states. It's not what they put down in writing, it's what they do in practice. So, the idea is, at some point in time, states start engaging in a particular activity. As time passes, more and more states engage in this activity until virtually you have a universal custom where all the states in the international system are doing that activity. Then they begin to perceive that activity as obligatory, that it is required by law, and it becomes a norm of international law. So diplomatic immunity. Diplomatic immunity started as a practice. States said, you know, it's probably a good idea not to mess with a diplomat, or a diplomat's spouse, or a diplomat's children, because we want to maintain good relations with our states. And so for good, pragmatic, practical reasons, states started refraining from arresting, harassing, molesting, killing, and so on, diplomats. It started for pragmatic, practical reasons. 
Over a period of years, this practice became regularized so that virtually all the states in the international system were granting diplomatic immunity. Then they began to perceive that that, that norm, that practice, was obligatory, that it was required by law. That's when we had a rule of customary international law. Very, very important way in which international law is created. So treaties, we all know what a treaty is. But just as treaties create law, so do, so too does customary practice that evolves over a period of years. So diplomatic immunity, 12 nautical mile territorial sea, certain human rights norms, and so on. Okay. So what does international law say about chemical weapons? So what weapons are we talking about? One of the things that I always think is useful is when you talk about chemical weapons is to break down what can actually fall in this so-called category of chemical weapons. So I'm going to give you three types of weapons. So there are chemical weapons, what I'm calling chemical weapons per se. These are chemicals which obviously have lethal effects. So mustard gas. During the First World War, one reason that the First World War was so devastating was because of the use of mustard gas consisting of chlorine and sulfur. Produced horrible lethal effects on individuals. And this was actually a poster that was being circulated during the Second World War to alert servicemen of what mustard gas would smell like. Garlic, horseradish, or mustard. Could be lethal. Supposedly, because Hitler himself had been gassed with mustard gas, there was no significant use of gas during the war against belligerents. It was used domestically, as we know, in Germany. But there was no use of gas of any significance during the war, in part because it was seen to be militarily not very useful. At the same time, people saw how devastating and destructive it could be. Another type of chemical weapon, sarin gas. So sarin gas has been used most recently in the conflict we'll talk about in Syria, but was also used in 1995 in the subway bombing in Tokyo by Um Shinrikyo, a terrorist group. They used sarin gas, which was detonated in various subway cars, having a very lethal effect. A number of individuals were killed, and a number of, greater number of individuals had to go to the hospital. So those are chemical weapons, chemicals. A second type of agent that we speak about are toxins. Toxins are things which are poisons that are produced through some biological process. So ricin, what you see over there are castor oil beans. Castor oil beans can be used to create this toxin called ricin. Botulism, the botulinum toxin is produced through botulism that can then have a toxic effect. What you actually see here are some captured ammunition from Iraq in 1991, which indicated that it contained botulism toxin in it. So you got chemical weapons, you have toxins which are biologically produced, and then finally you have pathogens. And I, I put up here uh, perhaps one of the best known, anthrax. When we talk about germ warfare, this is what we're talking about. Pathogens are biologically alive. They can be viruses, they can be bacteria, and they have deadly effect. So anthrax spores on the left, a copy of the letter that was sent to Senator Daschle, which contained anthrax a number of years ago. Pathogens. So those three agents we talk about, chemical weapons, toxins, and pathogens. And what's the law on these things? Starting place is the 1925 Geneva Gas Protocol. Now, note when it was adopted, not too long after World War I. This was adopted because of the horrible use of gas during the First World War. It prohibits the use in war of asphyxiating, poisonous, or other gases, and of all analogous liquids, materials, or devices. So this would prohibit all those things we talked about, chemical weapons, biological weapons, pathogens, and toxin weapons. Those would be analogous liquids, 
war materials. It prohibits their use in war. Note that, their use in war. Okay. It doesn't prohibit their use domestically. It prohibits their use in war. It also doesn't prohibit possessing them, manufacturing them, or stockpiling them. It produces, prohibits their use in war. In 1972, the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention was concluded. By the way, first note on the Geneva Gas Protocol, 137 parties, Syria is a party to that treaty. Syria is a party to that treaty. 1972 Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention, 170 parties, Syria is not a party to that convention. This prohibits not just the use, but the manufacturing and stockpiling of biological and toxin weapons. In other words, you cannot even make these things. You cannot even produce those things, let alone use those things. Final treaty to note is the 1993 Chemical Weapons Convention. 190 parties, excluding Syria. The Chemical Weapons Convention is a dramatic convention because it prohibits not just the use of chemical weapons, they're prohibited sooner, but the manufacturing and stockpiling of chemical weapons, and it creates an international organization, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, the OPWC, which has the authority to conduct site visits, investigations within various states that are parties to the convention for inspections to make sure that people are not producing chemical weapons. At the end of the convention, there's a long appendix which details what constitutes chemical weapons for purposes of this prohibition. And finally, there's customary international law. Now, how does that fit into this? I would argue the Geneva Gas Protocol clearly prohibits the use of chemical weapons in war. The Biological Weapons Convention prohibits manufacturing, stockpiling, and use, period. The Chemical Weapons Convention prohibits manufacturing, stockpiling, and use as well. Well, what about the use of chemical weapons domestically in civil war? I would argue that customary international law prohibits the use of chemical weapons in any kind of armed conflict, not just in state-to-state -state war, but in any kind of armed conflict. My contention would be that that is a rule of customary international law. By the way, trivia question. 1925 Geneva Gas Protocol. The U.S. ratified it. Does anybody know when? Huh? 1975. Gerald Ford was president when the U.S. ratified the 1925 Geneva Gas Protocol. Well, you know, 50 years later, but at least they they got around to ratifying it. The U.S. ratified the other two treaties much more contemporaneously. So that's essentially the law dealing with chemical weapons. Now, what does the Syrian case look like? United, mission to United Nations mission to investigate allegations of the use of chemical weapons in the Syrian Arab Republic issued a report in September, a report on the alleged use, and they determined that there was widespread evidence of the use of sarin gas. Widespread evidence. They took a variety of biological samples. They interviewed a number of people. Independent Commission determined that there was a widespread use of chemical weapons at least on the 21st of August 2013 in the Damascus area. Conclusion of the United Nations. Now, a logical question is who is responsible for this? And here's the actual the United Nations team probing the, probing the possible use of chemical weapons found clear and convincing evidence that sarin gas was used in the incident that occurred on the 21st of August. The report makes the chilling uh, Ban Ki-moon uh, basically said, the briefing to the Security Council the team, which concluded chemical weapons have been used in the ongoing conflict between the parties in Syria, also against civilians, including children, on a relatively large scale. So that's Ban Ki-moon, Secretary General of the UN, saying on a relatively large scale. Who's responsible? 
intelligence agencies in Israel, the US, France, Turkey, Germany conclude that the Syrian government was responsible. Same time, the Russians and the Syrians say the Syrian opposition was responsible. So there's a little bit of a contention. But you'd expect the Syrian government to say it wasn't responsible for this. The general consensus has been that Syria, from the governmental perspective, was in fact responsible for the use of chemical weapons. My conclusion, based on this evidence and based on the UN report, is that the Syrian government used chemical weapons clearly in violation of international law. Okay. That's not necessarily controversial. What's controversial is a little bit of what's going to come now. Okay, so what do you do? President Obama delivered an address on September 10th where he appeared before the nation and the world, detailed what he felt was evidence of the use of chemical weapons by the Syrian government, and then said, and that is why, after careful deliberation, I determined that it is in the national security interest of the United States to respond to the Assad regime's use of chemical weapons through a targeted military strike. So the President of the United States said, Syria has used chemical weapons. I have determined as president that we should respond through a targeted military strike. The president then went on in this speech of September 10th to say, but while I have the independent authority under the Constitution as president, I'm going to send this to Congress to consult. So that kind of slowed the process down, and I'd be happy in Q&A to talk more about the the details of how that happened. That slowed the process down, and then the Russians got involved and some other things happened, but, but for now, let's focus on what the president said. I determined that it is in the national security interest of the United States to respond to the Assad regime's use of chemical weapons through a targeted military strike. And we were all ready for that. At least I was ready for that, in the sense of I thought that was gonna happen. Well, would such a strike be lawful? So, for a moment, agree with me that the Syrian regime used chemical weapons. Let's say that's true. There's some disagreement. I conclude that's what happened. But let's just assume that that's correct. Would the use of military force by the United States be lawful? Here we got to talk a little bit about one area of international law the law relating to the use of military force, sometimes called the use ad bellum, the law to war. These are the legal rules that establish when international actors can lawfully use force against other international actors, the use ad bellum. Well, what does the use ad bellum say? Well, the starting place was that document that I pulled out of my pocket a little bit ago which I may or may not be able to find, having buried it somewhere else in my pocket, the United Nations Charter. Again, a treaty ratified by 193 states. It establishes the basic framework for the law relating to the recourse to force. The starting place of the UN Charter is Article 2, Paragraph 4. All members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. Article 2.4 sets forth a basic prohibition, a basic proscription on the use of force. And not just a proscription on the use of force, but a proscription on the threat to use force, which would in some way be against the territorial integrity or political independence of states which would in some way transgress the purposes of the United Nations. That's the starting point. Following two devastating wars, the framers of the United Nations, sitting around a table in San Francisco in the spring of 1945, said that we simply cannot permit the unrestricted use of military force. The League of Nations had failed. The Kellogg-Briand Pact had failed. And so these framers in San Francisco said, we don't want to fail again. 
So the basic fundamental cornerstone of the United Nations is Article 2.4, proscription on the threat of use of force. Now, remember, our question is, would an American strike against Syria for the Syrian use of chemical weapons be lawful under international law? Well, there are two exceptions contained in the Charter to Article 2.4. The first is contained in Article 51 of the Charter. The second is contained in various provisions of Chapter 7 of the Charter. Article 51 says this. Nothing in the present Charter shall impair the inherent right of individual or collective self-defense if an armed attack occurs against a member of the United Nations until the Security Council has taken measures necessary to maintain international peace and security. Okay? So, we have two options. A state can lawfully use force in self-defense if there has been an armed attack against that state, or a state can use force if it has been authorized by the UN Security Council. And the Security Council does this pure, they just, just yesterday uh, authorized additional use of force in the Central African Republic case. They authorized use of force against Libya. They authorized the use of force against Iraq in 1990. So the Security Council can do that. In the Syrian case, there was no UN Security Council authorization. Why? Because the Russians and the Chinese didn't want it. And the way the Security Council works is the five permanent members, the United States, Great Britain, France, Russia, and China, all have a veto, which means they can say for any substantive resolution, no. And if they say no, any one of them says no, the resolution is not adopted. And it was clear in the Syria case that that was going to be the case. So, this would be the only article on which the United States could authorize, could legitimately use force under the Charter framework. So, would the U.S. use of force be lawful? I ask that to you. No is the right answer. Who said yes? Okay. <laughs> Under the UN Charter framework, there's no way that you could argue that an American use of force would be lawful under international law. Now, I'm not saying that's good, bad, or indifferent. I'm just saying that's what the UN Charter framework says. That's what the law of the Charter tells us. Now, Think about what this is actually saying. The UN Charter prohibits the threat of use of force. It says force can be used if the Security Council authorizes it, or if there's been an armed attack, states have a right of individual or collective self-defense. What the President said was, in Syria, there has been a horrible violation of international law by the Syrian regime. Do I think that was true? Yes. Does that mean that the United States has the right to unilaterally use force under international law against Syria? No. How would force be authorized against Syria if you wanted to authorize it? Security Council. So it actually put the United States in a very strange position where the United States was saying Syria has violated international law. And the facts seem to support that. But just because a state has violated international law does not necessarily mean that another state can unilaterally use force against that state to enforce the law. So, maybe it's a good thing that the Russians intervened. Where are we now? So, this is a, a heavy conversation that took place. The Russian government, who obviously had been supporting the Syrian regime, came in at the last minute following Obama's speech and said, look, let's see if we can work out a deal where the Syrians will agree to submit to inspections by the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, and the chemical weapons can then be removed. Well, intense negotiations, John Kerry, uh, sitting there, Wendy Sherman, uh, next to John Kerry, negotiating this, they reach an agreement. The Syrians say, okay, 
We'll let the inspectors in and we'll let you check out our chemical weapons. So on the 27th of September, which happens to be my mother's birthday, uh, the Security Council uh, decided that Syria shall complete the elimination of all chemical weapons materials and equipment in the first half of 2014. And as many of you know, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons has visited Syria. They have collected caches of chemical weapons. And right now the question is, what do you actually do with them? How do you destroy them? Where do you destroy them? And so that's one of the issues. There's a lot more inspection that needs to be done. And many are still concerned that Syria may be holding back some of these chemical weapons. But up to this point, it looks as though Syria is complying about as much as it can with the Security Council resolution and with the agreement that was reached. So, where are we today? Any use of force by the United States or other states has at least been held in abeyance, pending seeing what's going to happen with Syria. And I, all I can say in conclusion is, We'll see what happens. Two points about law. Use of chemical weapons, I would argue, clearly unlawful. Clearly unlawful, and I would argue, is attributable to the Syrian regime. United States use of force and response, if it would have taken place, clearly a violation of the United Nations Charter framework for the recourse to force.